Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last session. Uh, all of our speakers are corporate law professors, so it makes it much easier to introduce them. Our first speaker is Professor Rob Danes from Stanford University School of Law. Rob, please. All right, I, w uh, I want to start. Sure, just tell me when I'm 15. I'll try to talk quickly. I think that's acceptable in Israel, isn't that right? Uh, I'll talk quickly and then give you time to ask questions if you have any, or get rid of me sooner, which is, we'll both be happier. Uh, I'll start by saying thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. I um, have an impressive group of academics, and so it's really fun for me to be here. Um, so I was thinking, after, at the end of the day, why do you care about what I have to say? And I'm not sure I have an answer, but the first reason is I'm not going to say anything about MFW. That's my main goal today. <laughs> the second one is that I have some evidence of potential managerial misbehavior or, or sneakiness, that's the technical term, and that's sometimes interesting. So if at the end of the day I've shown you some evidence of uh, agency cost or sneakiness, that, that's kind of interesting. But um, I saw from the first session that maybe you're plenty suspicious already of managers. So um, maybe that, that uh, note's been played enough. So maybe the counter would be that um, the moral of the story may be that even people who are second-guessing managers, even smart, well-intentioned people can uh, screw up themselves. So that's a, that's a little bit of the story here, sort of unintended consequences of trying to stop managerial misbehavior. That's the subplot, and now I'm just gonna try to back up and tell you a little bit how I get there. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start with charts. Why do you care? This is my, ch it's not my chart, but it has how we'll start. This is why people care. This is a talk about executive compensation, and this says why people care about executive compensation. This is most of the analysis we get usually, which is, at least in the U.S., and increasingly U.S. patterns uh, you see actually all over the world, but the, the ratio of CEO pay to production workers increases, has increased dramatically over time. This is, uh, this is an, uh, an older chart, but the patterns are continued. The only thing that increases faster than this ratio, though, is academic papers devoted to studying CEO pay, and that's on the green. That's, uh, this is my contribution here. I want to show you uh, one more chart, uh, a couple more charts, um, and this is also somebody else's chart. With, with any luck, I will go through the entire uh, talk and never show you any original research. So this is somebody else's chart, and this is a chart that launched many resignations, um, more SEC investigations and lawsuits than any other chart I know of in recent history. This is the company stock price performance um, before and after an option grant. And this was a paper by Heron and Lee where they say, look, CEOs are getting, uh, these are unscheduled options, so uh, options that one year happen in May, the next year happen in August. And if you look what happens to the stock price before, it dropped abnormal, there are abnormal declines before these grants are dropped and then abnormal increases after the grants are given. And so this um, shows ab regular predictable abnormal returns before an option grant and abnormal predictable large returns after. And you know from your finance that this is really unusual and this is, it shouldn't be predictable returns. Something fishy is going on here. This is, this is a sign of some misbehavior. And uh, people figured out, well, what's happening is not that the company stock price is falling before and rising afterwards is that managers are backdating options. That is, they're giving options uh, today but pretending they got them a long time ago. And here's a, another chart that I did not create, but this is uh, from the Wall Street Journal. The authors of this got uh, Pulitzer Prizes, and they went through a number of particular companies and said, well, let's look at, uh, well, I can't see if I can read this from here, Converse Technology, and let's look at the grants and always the CEO is getting grants at the lowest price of the month and that can't be that can't be a chance look at it's always getting it on the lowest price they have to be backdating and of course that's what they decided was happening is that the CEOs were basically lying about when they got the grant what would happen is they were actually getting the grant here they were just pretending they were given the grant here so this led to a backdating scandal and many people resigned we actually got more CEO and CFO and director resignations after this was uh, released the outrage public outrage about backdating was enormous and CEOs were fiddling with uh, sort of uh, corporate documents to benefit themselves instead of shareholders. 
and this generated a lot of outrage. Um, resignations all over the place. So what happens? Well, there's a problem, so lawyers come to fix the problem. They're here to help. And um, we have federal requirements, U.S. requirements, to say, well, the problem is if you're saying you gave it a month ago, but you really just gave it yesterday, let's make people report their options right as soon as they give them. So federal requirements, you have to do it within two days. Let's make it online, because online is better uh, with everything. And let's also give them more disclosures about dates and prices and firms' policy. So more disclosure, that's the good one. Well, now, the other thing that happened is uh, a number of academics said, well, we can help too. And uh, Lucian Bebchuk and Jesse Fried, uh, famous, you may have heard of them here, uh, said, well, we're, we're here to help as well. What can we do to help? And they said, well, the problem is these darn managers are giving grants irregular times through the year. Let's just, and then they're lying about it. Let's just say you have to give it the same time every year. So every May 1st, you're gonna get your, we should make, encourage companies to give May 1st options every single time. Does that make sense? Then you can't lie and say you got it in June or July or whatever. So these are called scheduled options, and many academics said, well, let's make the grants be made at the same day every year. And the accountants went along for that, and so now that's considered an audit risk and, uh, by some accountants. The PCAOB said, well, look to make sure they're giving options the same time every year that they're scheduled, and then we'll be sure there's no funny business. So now 60% of all options that are granted are scheduled. You get them May 1st every year because then there's no funny business, right? So and everyone cheers. And people are super happy about it and say mission accomplished. Uh, everybody's super happy about that. So now I understand it's a Ted set the standard. He likes to put other people's faces on other people's bodies. So I tried this. So uh, I said, that's a bad job, but that's my version of it. Uh, people said, well, this is terrific once we fixed it. Backdating is eliminated. Uh, you can't do this any longer. And in fact, if you look at the stock price returns after these new regulations and after the attention from the academics, you don't see the drop anymore. For the unscheduled options, they're uh, predictable. And the scheduled options are all even. And there's no big V. And we win. And the bad guys lose. So uh, I'm not so sure. And my paper here with a couple of my co-authors at BYU says, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. And why? What's the intuition? The intuition is really simple, and I'll show you one chart, and then I have some robustness tests if you want to talk about that, but it's pretty simple to get, and that's this. If I tell you that next year you're going to get a ton of options on May 1st, and it's going to be 80% of your compensation for that year, what are, what are your incentives the month before that in April? You're going to get options at the market price in, in May. You're, you don't have great incentives in April. Uh, you know, maybe February, March, not that great either. So what this does is to loading all these options at the same time every year gives a predictable time each year where the CEOs have bad incentives. They don't want to maximize the stock price because they're going to get options at the current stock price. Does everybody get that? Simple story, right? Uh, not very theoretical. I'm not up to the, uh, the normal snuff here. It's a, I'm a simple man. So I have charts from other people, really simple stories, but that's, that's my story, I'm, I'm sticking to it. They don't have incentive to maximize stock price before the grant, so what are they gonna do? They're gonna delay gains. If you could make an investment now and make a lot of money for the firm, or you could do it in three months after you get your options, if you're a cynical person, you would do the right thing, but maybe your friend might not. Your friend might delay the investment, right? So you might, your friend might delay gains, your friend, not you, of course, but your friend might accelerate bad news. In May, you're going to get the options. Well, let's get all the bad news out in February, March, and April. You might, uh, they, your friend might do that again. And maybe even if, you, if your friend could, maybe she'd even manufacture temporary declines. That is, it'd be nice if the day, I mean, this is ridiculous. Nobody could do this. But the day before you get the grant, there was a little drop in the stock price. And then the day after, it went back up to normal. Now, not that anybody could do that, but that would, if you had a magic wand, you might want to be interested in doing that. Okay, so the question for this paper is, how much time do I have? Ten minutes, okay. I'll talk slower. Um, the question is, do CEOs respond to this incentive? That is, they have this perverse incentive, do they respond to it? And uh, the way we're going to look is to look for these telltale V around the option grant. Now. People have done this before. That's why I had the picture of you know, mission accomplished Bush and Bebchuk and 
Uh, those two have probably never been linked before very often, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to uh, link them uh, to say, well, let's look at everybody to see what happens. And they look at scheduled and unscheduled, and I'm going to try to show you that, uh, what they look today. So here are all U.S. options in public firms that, which I, that I can get a hold of. Um, and it's from 2007 to 2011, and is every firm that grants options. And this is all after the new regulations, after the new regime has fixed all the problems. And these are all scheduled options. That is, if you get them every year at the same time. This is the day you get them. And you look, this is one month before, two months before, one month after, two months after. Looks like there's a little dip, but not, frankly, very much. And I think this is what people looked at to say, oh, mission accomplished. There's not a very big V. It drifts down a little over a few months, but, but nothing to get excited about. But that's looking at the wrong group, I think. And our contribution, in part, is to say, well, you don't want to look at everybody, right? You want to look at the people who are getting a lot of options. If Ted's getting a few options and Zohar's getting a lot of options, Zohar would have the incentive to, to play with the stock price more than Ted. Does that make sense? So let's split Ted from Zohar, and let's look at now just the people who are getting a lot of options, and we'll look at the top third and see what their stock price looks like. It looks more like this. So. This is down, so from four months before, look at this line here. This is the stock price drop before the grant is given to the top third of the, comp of the CEOs getting stock price, getting options. And this is what happens after. And it basically goes down, what, 3% and then up 3%. That sounds small. Like 3% doesn't, for most of us, we think that's kind of tiny. But in finance terms, a 3% abnormal return is huge. It's sort of suspiciously large, frankly. So I'm a, uh, that's a little too strong for me. But let's cut through more. Let's see the, uh, let's look at CEOs who have especially poor incentives. That is, let's say Zohar, I'm going to make him the bad guy again. Let's say uh, he's got stock options, but he's going to, let's say he's going to sell them. He needs to sell some stock next month. He wants the stock price to be high, right? So let's throw out all the, the Zohars who are going to sell stock and leave just the people who have got a lot of stock options who don't actually also sell. And this is the stock price that you get. It drops down the people who have really bad incentives. It's this suspiciously large predictable decline before they get the grant, followed by this suspiciously large predictable increase after they get the grant. And you know that's basically the paper. I have a lot, I've run a lot of regressions, a lot of robustness tests, but it turns out that this pattern holds, it's statistically significant. No matter what you do to control for it, you kick the tires, control for anything you can control for it that I've been able to see, and you always see this thing, which is, let me see if I have, I'm gonna skip. Trust me, there's t numbers, we can skip them. Uh, that is, negative pre-grant, positive post-grant returns, especially for the CEOs who have motivation who are getting a lot of their compensation this way. They have the even larger declines. That makes me think there's something connected to motivation. The fact that the stock price drops more when they would profit more from having it decline tells me uh, that they may be related. Uh, it holds when you run regressions. And that's as much as I'll say <laughs> uh, about that now. That is, if you... Um, if you control for the, the number of stocks, the makeup of the board, whether there's a control shareholder or not, um, all of these relationships still hold. That is, the more stock options you get, the more your company's stock price will drop before. Um, now, when I presented this paper, the first time I had results, I presented it in Palo Alto to a bunch of the Stanford alums, and they said, oh, that's cute. Um, I said, well, this is a big deal. They're going to make four to five hundred thousand dollars a year with the stock price movement, more than they would otherwise have made by these abnormal returns. And the Stanford folks said, "Well, that's cute. Four hundred thousand. Who would do anything wrong for four hundred grand? That's nobody would do that." And uh, I see you might have different intuitions about. Uh, I know one or two people who might be persuaded uh, to do something wrong for four hundred grand. And uh, but it's each year, right? yeah, it's each year. So if you can do it for, so 400 for you is nothing, but if you can do it over and over, yeah, it might get, it might get your interest. I think that's probably right. All right, so 
just a quick, uh, few quick robustness things, then I'm going to stop and let you ask questions if there's time, unless I've talked too much already. And that is one thing that I think is interesting is this relationship is bigger when other insiders also get stock that day. So when the CFO gets options in the same week, the stock price drops more and increases more. When there are other officers and directors who get stock that same week, the stock price drops more and increases more. So it's, there's something about this. Now, I'm not saying it's a, a conspiracy. Uh, I'm not saying they, you know, they pass uh, indiscreet emails back and forth about, hey, if we can just drop the stock price a little bit, we'll all make money. But it might be that they just each have a little bit of incentive to not quite work as hard or produce as good as news during that month. Now, how would they do it? Uh, 30 seconds on how they might do it. These are the stock price returns for the CEOs who get the most options uh, when they release 8Ks, which is company news. Before, let me walk over here, before the grant, when there's an 8K released, shareholders think it's bad news. And after they get the grant, shareholders think, oh, that's good news. So that's the people who get high compensation. You can see bad news before the grant, good news after. The, the CEOs who don't get many options, they don't show that pattern. That is you know, roughly good news kind of before and after. So this difference suggests to me that there's something about disclosure patterns going on. That's also statistically significant. If we look at the earnings, it looks like the CEOs who get a lot of options miss their earnings before the grant, and they make their earnings after the grant. Surprise, surprise, right? So that's, that's not true with the, you don't get that same pattern with the CEOs who are not compensated in that way. So that's kind of suspicious, at least it's consistent with my concern. And then finally, if you look at company guidance, that is company sometimes issues guidance to say, you know, we're doing well, we're doing poorly. Same thing, guidance is negative before the grant, then there's the grant, and then there's, it's positive after the grant. That is before the grant, they're saying, ah, I don't know, I hope we make it. And then after the grant, hey, going great, we're gangbusters, it turns out everything's okay. These are uh, companies issued guidance states of uh, CEOs who are not in the top third. That is, and you don't see the same exact pattern, that is, this is positive, they have good news right before they get the grant. That's something that the other guys don't. So um, this is consistent with a story of managers timing disclosures and investments in their own self-interest and not in the interest of shareholders. And that it lasts for a long time. That is, I've shown you that the stock price is abnormally low for what, five months a year. And it's low at a predictable time in a way that benefits the CEOs who would benefit from having it low. And uh, last thing, so what do you do about it? I will leave it to you and maybe you'll solve it and then I can copy your ideas and claim it as mine. Can I, am I done? Do I have, uh, okay. I'll, okay, you wanna be the bad guy or the good guy? Yes. If you combine um, the amount of options So when you can dribble it out through the year, right? You just give uh, one twelfth every month. You could do something like that. No. Average the, the price. price. The amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, the amount of options that the CEO gets, uh, uh, you get uh, tax favored treatment if you give options at the current stock price. And at least if the stock price has been rising, you would be uh, giving them an average, the weighted average of the stock price over time would be less than the current stock price, which means you would be taxed higher for that. You'd be taxed more. 
but, but let, let me intervene here. The number of stock options. I mean, we have a you know, one thing that is fixed. Not the X That's X X only the number. Oh, okay. if, if the stock price is X, you get 10. And if it's X, yeah. Um, so that would be a good way to do it. Um, it turns out. The model that, 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 uh, right, they have to know about it. In advance, right? So it's, there's no motivation. So that's one option. That would fix it. Um, it it's turns complicated out. to find the, you know, the, the, the right same way to do it, but yeah. if you put it in, in the model, so it would take up the motivation. Yeah, yeah. I, think that, uh, I think that's one way to do it. Yeah, uh, hi. This is all uh, you analyze public information. Right. So I don't know if it exists or not, but you would expect that you can check each CEO and legislate. The heck out of it. You know, yeah, just uh, kill I would them. expect to see many lawyers analyzing backwards. Yeah. So here, here's the problem with that. I, th so if you're a board member, you see this, you think, I want to do the right thing. I'm really going to watch my CEO. Uh, the problem is, is it's really hard to detect in individual cases. That is, let's say uh, Ted comes to me and says, you know, I'm on to you. I think you're releasing the good news. The problem is it's really easy for me to say, look, I'm just being cautious. I'm a cautious guy. I know there's potential risks out there. I want to make sure everybody knows about the risks. So I'm just releasing the bad news early because that's the kind of guy I am. And if there's good news, I don't want to blow smoke now. I'll wait till later and just confirm the good news. And so I release all the bad news now and I release all the good news later. And that looks like I'm being cautious and careful and reasonable. It just happens to dovetail precisely with my self-interest. And so I think in each individual case, it's going to be really hard to catch. It's only an aggregate that the pattern is so hard to defend because it dovetails so neatly with my self-interest. You have at least several CEOs that are CEOs over a long period of time. Right. We see it. Right. But you are 10, 12 years CEOs, not only right. CEOs, but major executives. So would, uh, you'd see fingerprints. Over, over right. time, can't you? So here's the, here's the problem. That is, in the portfolio, that is, I take all the options, and you get this really striking V. But in individual cases, you won't always, you won't see the V. That is, this year, you'll see a drop, and then it goes flat. Next year, you'll see a flat, and then an increase. The year after that, maybe you see nothing for two or three years in a row. Then after that, you see flat and drop, and then drop, you know, flat and then increase. And in the portfolio, it'd be, wow, that's a V. But in each year, you, it won't be a V. Does that make sense? So you're right, and maybe over time you spot predictable patterns, and the plaintiff's attorneys, I think, are going to be looking for that pattern shortly. But it, they won't find the easy V. So now I'm going to exercise my role as the bad person here and take the uh,